Layovers, your weekly dose of aviation innovation. Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome aboard from the flight deck. This is Paul Pavadivitriou. Hello everybody, this is Alex Hunter. We'll be your pilots for this show about the news, the startups and the technologies defining the modern air travel experience. Our flight time today, an hour and seven minutes, and we expect an of arrival. Coming up on this flight, two US dollars to travel around Asia, bitcoins for the Polish airline lot, Spotify on board at Virgin America, a new stylish entrant in a smart carry-on space, a service that finds the best airline deals unless you beat them, a new ranking tells which airline treats passengers best when it comes to compensation, a farm at JFK, a mysterious Terminal 6 at London Heathrow, the backstories of a pilot in Turkey through Instagram. As we reach our cruising altitude, I'm going to turn off the fast signal sign for you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, and let's turn on those noise-canceling headphones. Flight 26 to Mumbai. Hi, Alex. Hi, Mumbai. Wow. That was a city you didn't want anyone to know about no. in our previous episodes. No, so <laughs> I, yeah, I went there uh, to film an episode of Attaché kind of at last minute because uh, on Secret Flying, which is a fantastic website for finding uh, unusual destinations and fares, a great deal popped up. And I I don't think I could, could resist. So I emailed Greg, who films the show with me, and said, you want to go to India? <laughs> Neither of us had been before. So we did. We decided to to do it. And it was it was unbelievable. I think the episode will be out in about a week. And it's going to be uh, it's going to be stunning. I'm, I'm really excited about it because what, really what a place. What a it. place. Yeah, it is. Right. Um, b- before, because we're going to talk about your routing there, obviously, because it was quite interesting. You mentioned secret flying. But before to do that, we don't have any shout outs this week. Uh, because uh, of course we've been uh, uh, away for travel both of us actually you know at the beginning of the show for those listening there's I, my voice says this is a weekly show. Well, <laughs> sometimes we're not really very, uh, very good and disciplined. We're, we're out doing field research. Absolutely. But before we go on to the the, the travels, uh, we just quickly want to wish well to the CEO of United, uh, Munoz, who had a heart attack, is now uh, on medical leave. Uh, I want to mention that because we know that we both tend to sometimes criticize United. Uh, he was doing a great job up to now, but it shows that how hard and tough that job must be. Uh, he's been replaced by an interim CEO for the moment. Uh, so really, uh, wish him well. We hope that uh, he'll be back at the helm very quickly. Yeah, tough, tough situation and really wish him the best. I mean, that airline cannot catch a break, can they? Yeah, yeah. They really get a bet. They will eventually. Uh, but uh, so one of the things that United has a problem with is obviously, you know, this merger with Continental, which creates a lot of issues. You've kind of experienced that with uh, BEA. So BEA, the parent company of BEA is called IAG, and they also own Iberia. And uh, so tell us the story. This, so I'm going to try and tell this as, as um, briefly as possible because there's a lot of nuance and detail. Some I think a lot of you guys will get a kick out of, but um, to get this fare, which was, I think, 208 pounds round trip to Mumbai from, from London, which is staggering. Uh, we had to start the trip in Madrid so that you don't get all of the uh, the taxes that that people flying out of London or the UK get. So, which is fine. So we the the original routing was Madrid, London, Mumbai, London. We didn't have to go back to Madrid. Uh, it was an open what's called an open draw flight. So of course we had to get to 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 Madrid in the first place. So that was a separate booking on on BA out of London City, my favorite airport in London, and. Because it was an early flight, I decided I'll stay near the airport in a hotel. And the evening before our flight, I get a, a text message as I'm on my way to London saying, uh, from BA saying, we're really sorry, but your your flight tomorrow to Madrid is going to be operated by Cello Aviation and not BA. And I was like, hold on a second. Who are these guys? <laughs> exactly. Who the hell is Cello Aviation? So- I, some quick Google, and I was like freaking out. Not freaking out because I was worried about anything, but I just more annoyed that I 
you know, I'd, we, I'd bought business class tickets down to, uh, <clears throat> to Madrid because we'd had a, we had a long day of flying ahead of us and we needed to start it off in comfort. At least that was my rationale for using my miles. <laughs> um, anyway, so I started Googling these guys and it turns out that they're a, um, they're a wet lease company based in the UK that have, uh, and I sent Paul a message straight away saying it's a, it's an Avro liner. It's an RJ 85 which is the kind of high wing, four engine high wing British aerospace plane. So I was like, oh, I've never, well, I don't think I've been on one of those before. Maybe when I was a kid, I was like, okay, cool. And then a little more digging, looking at uh, at the tail number, and it was a 46 seat all business class configuration. The plane was is usually used for uh, taking Premier League football teams around Europe, kind of taking rock bands on tour. So I was, so, I, <laughs> I very quickly went from disappointment to excitement. I was like, all right, such cool, a rock cool. store addict. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, all right, this will be a neat experience. You know, another another kind of chapter in the story. So I get to the hotel, and the next morning, wake up to a text message saying, um, "So the replacement plane needs to be replaced." <laughs> And, I was like, I, and your flight has been delayed as a result of this. So I was like, oh, you're kidding me. Um, and it said something like, the flight is now being operated by this other company. I was like, are you serious? And a little Googling of that showed they had one BAE 146, which is the, the kind of spiritual predecessor to the RJ85. And this one was 31 years old and started life for my American friends at PSA. Which is a, a West Coast airline that is long def- well, was acquired by U.S. Airways, so it's somewhere the legacy is somewhere in a, the bowels of an American Airlines archive. And so I got to the, and I had to do a turnaround in Madrid, basically get back on another plane and come back to London. So I got to the 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 desk at, at London City, the ticket desk, and said, "Look, I'm going to Madrid," and the guy knew exactly what was going on. And I said, "I'm I'm basically going coming straight back." So. He was really proactive and started to sort out the problem immediately and said, look, it doesn't look like you're going to be able to get to Madrid in time to get the flight back. And I said, oh, okay, but that screws me because if I don't take the Madrid-London leg, they're going to cancel my London-Mumbai leg because that was all on one Absolutely. ticket, Yeah, which is uh, you know, kind of a big worry. He's like, don't worry. In the reservation system, we'll mark – the Madrid London sector as flown, so they won't cancel it. And that's like, amazing. Actually, isn't that great? That. I didn't yeah. even have to ask him or even think of suggesting that. He was super proactive, took care of it, and sure enough, I went home, saw my kids and my wife, went back out to Heathrow, sure, and everything went went really really smoothly. And and the BA flights to to Mumbai and back were were really, really awesome. But it was, it was, <laughs> that means we also didn't have to go to Madrid and we still got the fare, but um, it was, uh, it was quite, quite an adventure. But to the-, so the, the question I have, so, so they mark the flight as flown from yeah. Madrid to London. Do they give you miles for it? Not that I can see. No, I've got the, the tier points and the miles for London, Mumbai, Mumbai, London, but not for Madrid to London. And I, Guess that's okay, but here's the thing: it took forever to get the tier points because the Madrid, London, London, Mumbai was ticketed on Iberia flight numbers, even though uh, one of the sectors was on BA Metal, and they said it could take up to eight weeks for those to. In 2015, it can take eight weeks for that transaction to appear. It didn't, probably because I kicked up a fuss. Yeah, I've seen you. Uh, if people follow you on Twitter, you've been interacting with British Airways quite a lot. I- Who I admit, you know, they're really good. Once they get you into a into a private chat or on DM, they're really proactive, and 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 I, they will be that. That's the channel that I, I won't call anybody. I'll just go on Twitter, and they did a they did a good job. So it hasn't been eight weeks since the flight. So who knows? Those tier points may pop up eventually in in my uh, in my executive club account, but. It was, but that that shows that integration, even after all those years at Iberia, is part of the same group as BA. It's still, still not a, uh, still not really solved. Uh, there are many issues. And legacy software is one, obviously the main one, which comes back to my earlier point about United merging with Continental. It's not easy to make these things work. No, and even little things like 
trying to pick my seat. The BA site would just take me through to the Iberia site, which then said I didn't have the authority to do it. So a lot of tech integration stuff. That's, but you know, these are you're moving, trying to m- merge two juggernauts of the European uh, and world airline scene. So it it doesn't surprise me. And again, I think my flight experience with BA both there and back to Mumbai was was really really good. Yeah, I took a, I took actually a seven six seven from Athens to uh, back to London. So I was in Athens for work, uh, so I was wor- uh, traveling in, in in business class. But it's pretty staggering to be flying a wide body jet. For those who don't fly in Europe, usually, obviously, when you fly within Europe, you don't have wide body jet aircrafts. You have a lot of Airbus eight uh, three twenty etc. So yeah, I really felt I was leaving from Athens to go to New York or something. That's cool. But the experience, yeah. It, the, fly, the the planes are not brand new, obviously. A seven six sevens. They are. I think the one I was taking, you found it for me. It was, uh, I think, eighteen years old. You can feel that a little bit in the product, but honestly, what you get with older aircrafts, uh, you get the older business class, which means they are different seats than in economy. And they were pretty pretty cool. Uh, a little tip: if you fly BA with those. Uh, it's a two, three, two, uh, configuration, which means the only free seat for business class is actually in the middle row. For the first time in forever, I took a middle row <laughs> to have a free seat next to me. It was a fantastic experience. So I recommend you, Alex, trying the 767 as well. I think I'm going to, because I'm going to Istanbul in December and the options on BA were an A320. Or 767, and after your uh, your field research, as I said, that I think I've, <laughs> I've 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 already booked it. I've booked both ways in a 767. I will say one one, one thing though. There was a slight issue again. You, see, you can see that with legacy software. So I don't have any t- uh, st- status with B. I, actually, no, it's not true. I got yesterday finally my card for bronze, which is the lowest level besides having almost nothing. So I have, really have no status, which means that for BA you don't have a priority on seats, obviously. Which also means, strangely enough, that even if you fly business class, you have to pay to uh, reserve a seat more than 24 hours in advance, which is a bit uh, bizarre uh, when you look at the competition, but I mean, uh, fine enough. The thing though, I'm like, I'm using all these seat gurus and all the websites we're talking about to have to score the best seat. And I know that seats that usually are reserved uh, for elite uh, flyers will not be the inventory, will be kept until the last minute. So what I usually do, I check just like 24 to 36 hours before I fly any flights I take to see if one of the seats in the front suddenly appears as free. I go on the app, I see, of course, that one of the seats in the front row, also middle, because I really wanted middle this time, was free. Uh, so I try to, to take it on the app. The app tells me the error. We cannot do it. Please go online it's on the desktop. So I go on the desktop. I try to do that. It asks me this time that if I want that seat, I have to pay three quid. So three pounds. It's not that much. I say, why not? I say, I want that seat error. <laughs> Again, please call our hotline. It was a Saturday. I had to call, uh, the, I mean, the, the hotlines around in Greece were closed. So I had to call, uh, the UK. And then the poor lady, she probably was in the UK, by the way, uh, you know how these customer centers go, but she tried to book that seat for at least 25 minutes. They couldn't actually get it done. So That's I don't so know what weird. actually happened. Maybe somebody snapped me, obviously, but I mean, she, she sold that seat for free. Uh, there, there were two that interest me for free for at least 25 minutes. And every time she tried on her, on her hand, it didn't work. So it shows that again, sometimes these legacy software are not that uh, good at making the experience. It's okay. I was, of course, for the, at, at the moment when I was waiting on hold for 20 minutes, was what, what is going on here? It should be simple <laughs> to just switch a seat. But, you know, I mean, I had a great flight. I recommend uh, anyone flying to try to fly the 767 because apparently uh, they will obviously be replaced at some point uh, because, you know, they're reaching 20 years old. So I guess it will replace. Yeah, I think they have one that's 26 years old. Yeah, the oldest one is uh, 1990, 80, 89. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it's uh, wow. not, but they're really cool core aircraft. Honestly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool aircraft. Talking about BA, uh, so One World, uh, that's the alliance. You know, for those who don't know, there are three major alliances in the world. There's uh, One World, BA, there's Star Alliance, because basically Lufthansa and its group. And then there's Sky Team, which is Air France and KLM. Uh, One World is the smallest of the three, uh, either in terms of passenger flown, destinations, or number of aircrafts even, uh, and I think even number of airlines as well. Uh, and you found a piece of news that is interesting in regards to that. 
Yeah, so Skiff, too, it's a, a fantastic uh, industry website, has put together this sort of theory that IAG, the parent company of, uh, of British Airways and Iberia, as, as you said earlier, uh, are looking to expand that alliance or that agreement by acquiring Finnair. Now, there's been no confirmation by by either Finnair or BA or, or IAG or anyone like that. But at the Kappa Summit, which is an industry event they have in Helsinki, the there was a few uh, nods toward that, particularly by Finnair's chief commercial officer during a panel saying that uh, he dropped some pretty heavy hints that something like that could happen. And this has been interpreted more as a, a message from Finnair to, to IAG saying, for come get us. <laughs> I mean, as opposed to IAG saying this is something that we're we're actively looking at, uh, and there are a lot of, as you say, with the with the one world synergies. There's a lot. It would make a lot of sense because not only would they have parts of Southern Europe with with Iberia, obviously the UK and and Ireland with with Aer Lingus, but now moving up into Northern Europe as well. Yeah, it's a, it would be a great addition. It's a great airline. I haven't flown them forever. My mother was from Finland, so I used to fly them when I was a kid. Uh, but if you look at, for instance, the website like the Design Air, and you look at uh, the product, how it's evolved, it really, really, really looks nice. Your new A350, I think, yeah. looked really, really, really cool. So uh, and, it would be a nice catch for One World. And absolutely. And they have, they have strong uh, links to Asia, surprisingly strong links to Asia, actually. Uh, through Helsinki, uh, which is a great airport in itself, so I think it, yeah, it's an amazing airport sense. actually because it's uh, it's really not that big and you get through fast. Actually, the airport itself sees itself not as a hub, of course, like the Middle Eastern Airlines, but if you look as well at where it's located, because if you look at the routing of how planes go to Asia, of course, if they go north, they are pretty well placed in, yeah, in to deserve sense. Asia. That makes a lot of sense for the, for them. So it's a very efficient airline. Uh, I'm looking forward to try to fly them again soon. I might have to go to Asia at the end of the year, so I will take a look at uh, what they offer uh, and maybe secret flying again. But we'll mention secret flying a bit later. Uh, very quickly, Ryanair, uh, there's a rumor that Ryanair might be doing interlining agreements with BA. So interlining agreements means that they coordinate their flights. And if, for instance, one of your flights is being canceled, the other airline can take the passengers. You know, this, That just makes these kind of processes easy. But that's interesting because that would mean that a local, very, very, very low cost airline in Europe would actually make an agreement with a traditional flag carrier. So we'll see where it goes. But that's interesting. Yeah, and it also means you could do basically anywhere. It depends on the extent of the agreement, but you could do anywhere in Ryanair's network to anywhere in BA's network where there's no overlap. So that that could be huge. I mean, obviously, massive difference in product, but that that could be that could be great for both of them. For those who for those who fly uh, from uh, Australia to Europe, uh, you usually have to stop nowadays. With Qantas is uh, in Dubai, it used to be Singapore. There's a rumor that the airline is now looking to do direct flights from Sydney to London. Of course, that's thanks to the new type of aircraft. So I think it's a seven eight seven dash nine. Would you do that kind of long flight? <laughs> oh, I don't think that sounds fun at all. I know that. That Perth and London has been technically possible for a while, but now with this the seven eight seven nine, Perth to London would take eighteen hours, and that I don't know. That doesn't sound fun at all. Frankly, I'd rather get out in Dubai or or Bangkok, Abu Dhabi, or, or yeah, one somewhere like that. Stretch my legs for a few hours and then get back on a plane. But, but it makes sense for Qantas, I think. It makes sense to have. Oh, like, there are like, going to be a lot of people who will suck it up for eighteen hours and just do it. I think. I think it's yeah. It does make a lot of sense. Yeah, because every time I, at least every time I fly to to Dubai Airport, I can see that there's a lot and lot of people coming from Australia because it's oh, yeah. really their main hub now, basically outside <laughs> of Australia. Uh, still, quickly talking about the UK. I promise you guys will be moving on away from the UK because you will be sometimes tired of us only talking about our home country. <laughs> uh, there was uh, London Heathrow, so you know that uh, the airport commission has said that it's they should be given a third runway. We still don't know, of course, if that's going to happen, but there have been now uh, plans uh, that have been shown to the public so basically of course it's you know 3d imagery to see how it would look like the interesting bit there is that uh, because a lot of it is what was expected so basically there will be a massive terminal on the east side 
which is currently the Terminal 2, it will, and it will be taking over Terminal 3 and 1 and become this massive hub on one side. On the other side, the current Terminal 5, which is uh, British Airways, would be the Terminal West. And they would be adding a Terminal uh, Central, they call it, which would be seating next to the new runway. Again, that's if that happens, of course, if they have the money. But the, for me, the very interesting bit, because that's very science fiction almost to this point, <laughs> is that on the map you can see that they're thinking about a Terminal 6. So, uh, And you've been experiencing that as well, I think, Alex. Terminal 5 is, is huge, but it seems that BA doesn't have enough room already there. Yeah, they're... They really don't. I think there's a lot of instances where you have to wait for a gate. Uh, they're moving a lot of flights over to Terminal, Terminal three. 3. Significant amount of flights over to Terminal 3. Absolutely. And, I, and I, I'm still not 100% sure the, the, the reason for that. I'm sure there, there is a good reason beyond lack of capacity at, at T5. I think it's the bridging the gap between Terminal 1 closing and uh, more capacity with, with, with Terminal 3 and the expansion of Terminal 2. So, yeah, it's... I th- it's the Heathrow is definitely in a transitional phase right now. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to do what um, New York is doing. So JetBlue is starting growing potatoes at JFK. Have you seen that? Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> it's pretty I love cool, it. It's a great story. It's a great story. <laughs> it's, it's so they they grew, they grow that and they say that over time it could be also uh, products that could be used by, of course, the uh, shops at the airports, but also airlines. I don't know if yeah, it's going to go it's anywhere. A nice but idea. I think, yeah, the JetBlue is really doing some cool I stuff. I love JetBlue. I really think I, I they're fantastic. That. And that's a reason for those who fly to uh, JFK. That's a reason. If you can spot it and take a picture, we'd love to see one. I hope to go back to JFK uh, by uh, spring next year, and I will definitely try to find that because it's uh, it's really amazing. Oh, uh, and for those who are interested in the, you know, the very famous uh, TWA building, I'll put also an, a link in the show notes. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, she writes at the New York Times, Hiroko Tabuchi, was there and took some stunning pictures of it from the inside. There was an open day. Uh, it's going to be transformed in a hotel. She took really amazing pictures. If you love airports and you love uh, great design, t- 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 that terminal is really amazing. Um, next story. Oh, yeah. Your favorite airport, Hong Kong. Yeah, they've they've been thinking about doing a third runway for a long time now. And it looks like it's going to go ahead, but not for... Not for about ten years, which is which is really strange because they're you, Hong Kong is usually very proactive at, at, at this kind of infrastructure project. I mean, they built that the airport itself in an extraordinary amount of time. It looks like as a result of the airport already. And remember, this is not an old airport. <laughs> getting close to capacity, that they realized amazing. Yeah. that they need a, this third runway to allow for so many of these uh, these expanded flights, and I. They, they're worried that airports in the in the area like Shanghai and and, and Guangzhou will will overtake them. I think that just shows Shenzhen the, as well. Shenzhen is and Shen, yeah, and Shenzhen. I think that just really shows the uh, the continued growth. The growth, even yeah. even even with the the, the recent bumps. Uh, so they, they they say the new, new uh, runway might not be ready before twenty twenty three. That's still <laughs> earlier than probably what we're going to get here in London. But yeah, uh, do do you think it will be built over the sea again? I would have thought so. Yeah, I think they'll just continue to because it's two parallel runways right now. I think they'll just add another one uh, where the sea is right now. Yeah, Singapore is also planning another runway there. Uh, so we'll we'll see. That that shows the growth in Asia is pretty good. And talking about Asia, <laughs> we you we talked about uh, secret flying a few for a few episodes now. So you can see that this is a site we monitor because they really find great deals. And that deal was just mind blowing. Yeah, this is unbelievable. Like you say, secret flying are, are great for finding things that are are low enough where you're like, wow, I'm really starting to seriously consider spending a couple of hundred quid to go somewhere. But this, two dollars with Air Asia, who are a fantastic airline. These are uh, regional flights within Asia, but two U.S. dollars from from place like from Kuala Lumpur to Penang, Langkawi, which, and these these places are all like paradise. They're all the island resort places. Um, Kota Baru, Johor Baru, places all over uh, uh, Southern Asia for two U.S. dollars. That's just uh, – and it's not an error fair because uh, secret flying for those who uh, don't know yet is so they, they not only surface the good deals that airline promote, but also the the error fares, you know, the mistake that might happen. This is an actual promotion by AirAsia. So it's really crazy. It's incredible. Uh, 
I don't know if you can pay that with uh, Bitcoin, uh, but uh, I, we don't use Bitcoin. I don't think you use Bitcoin, right? No, and, I kind of uh, missed that. I feel like I missed that uh, that <laughs> boat. Me too. Uh, Lot, the Polish airline, which is also very good, and uh, we're monitoring that one. I mean, we both go to Poland uh, a few times a year, Alex and myself, is, has just now introduced uh, the, the fact that you can pay with Bitcoin. So if any one of you is want to try it, you can. So maybe that $2 could be paid with Bitcoin. But I track a lot of uh, different um, new apps and websites. I use uh, sites like Product Hunt, uh, Crunchbase, uh, AngelList, just to see, you know, what the startups are doing. And it's, it looks like these past few months, we've seen a lot of new websites uh, rising about trying to, you know, oh, I could fly from one point to another point, but, you know, I kind of hack the way to fly it. Uh, because, for instance, if you were to fly to a, one of these places that AirAsia flies to, you cannot actually usually say that to a traditional OTA, I want to fly it directly there and it, it, I will trust it to find me that $2 in the middle. Yeah. Uh, some people like Alex and myself will spend half a day two days a week finding crazy routings. But I mean, most of the people don't because they're finding boring or so maybe they don't have the time to do so. Or they have social lives. (laughs) Exactly. Not like (laughs) us. Uh, There's been a few, I'm not going to mention all of them today, but a few, one is called Fleischstein. So Fleischstein, I guess it's, uh, you know, the word is Einstein and flying, I guess. Um, It's interesting because it requires, it's nothing, I guess, nothing uh, in terms of algorithm that is completely mind blowing, but they use real people. So they use an Alex Center and a Paul Papa Dimitriou. Uh, and you go there, you submit your queries. You say, I want to go there. And these are my conditions. It's not only a, like, a destination point. You say, I want to fly uh, this day and I don't want to lay over that is and I'd rather have these kind of seat, et cetera, et cetera. You, you really put all the details you want. You send them and they have people to do that for you. So when I send that to Alex, because we always talk privately about the kind of stuff, he says, I'm not going to, I will never trust them to do that. Uh, because We're so good at doing it ourselves. But, and that's the thing I find very interesting, it's that they will reimburse their fee if you beat them on price. I and which I think is great. And I I I like services like these because I think it shows to shows people that you can get good deals and you don't have to rely on the the OTAs to to service the the best deals. Because as we were talking right before we started recording this podcast. We're both going uh, on on a trip in a few weeks with some kind of interesting routings, and the complexities Indeed. of those routings have have really kind of hammered home the point that there is no silver bullet for flight search. There is no one stop shop to get these great deals or these crazy fares or even complex bookings. So, putting a human in in, in the process can help with that. So, I like these things. I mean, like you said. I li- I like finding the fares. I like yeah. the challenge of of trying to surface the good ones. So it's not for me, but I think it's a good service, and I I wish them well. I'm actually tempted to try it and say, okay, this yeah. is the fare that I found. See see what you can do. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, because that's the added bonus of like saying I, th- I think I'm not sure. Uh, I don't have the website in front of me. I think they, they they charge you a fee for fifty. So they don't book for you. They will send you back the itinerary they found, and you are supposed to book. So you have to monitor your email as well, obviously, because usually these kind of bookings, sometimes there are very, the travel hacks that we find can be uh, very have a very low shelf life, uh, yeah. so uh, short shelf life, sorry. But they say, you know, if you beat us, we'll reimburse you. You will not going to charge you anything. So that actually incentivizes people like Alex and myself to try. So we might actually try. I'll also put a blog post of one person that tried it and shows you how what kind of queries it had so i think it's an interesting you should try it guys if you're not like us spending hours in front of your computer and if anyone from flyshine is actually uh, listening uh, we would love to have you on the show to actually how do you hire people like alex sancho to be your uh, <laughs> experts <laughs> we would love to know that um uh, another uh, uh in this kind of website is called quest organizer this idea is to say, okay, they will deconstruct your routing and say, okay, you will fly from point A to point B, but we'll add a point C in the middle, and that makes it a flight, uh, a less expensive flight. So they offer this. I've tried it. Have you tried a Quest Organizer, Alex? No, I didn't. I didn't so, immediately get the, the one thing. The point. And again, if you're if you're the founder, you want to reach out to us. The one thing I wasn't sure about. So they really. Not only they ask you for your destination and your, of course, your point of origin, but they actually actively tell you, 
These are the cities you could take a, a layover at, uh, which is really cool, by the way. Uh, but then they ask you, how many days would you like to spend there? And this is something that I'm not sure about because unless you have really, I mean, we have a lot of flexibility, but I'd rather have the tool tell me, okay, if you spend three days there, you can make this kind of savings. And not me having to tell the tool, I want to stay three or four days because I don't know. Maybe I'll decide to stay three days in a place in between my origin and destination because I have a cheaper deal, but I want the system to tell me that, not me to decide how many days I'll stop. Don't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So maybe maybe I, I only tried it once. I didn't book anything. So if you're the founder of Quest Organizer, if you want to reach out to us and tell us we're wrong, please do so. Because And people, try it. Let us know about your experiences there. Uh, we'd love to, to hear from you. Uh, the the one the big one here in the UK is called Skyscanner. I think you use it, Alex. I do, I do, and they're growing like crazy. I mean, they're already huge, but they're growing even more. There's a speculation about a new round of funding, right? New round of funding. They're opening offices all over the world. I think that they do great work. They they were really the pioneers of open ended search, where you yeah. could say, "I'm I'm I'm flying out of this area. Where can I go?" And they would show you that. That's that is a really really difficult thing to do, and they've they've been doing it for years. And uh, they might be valued at $1 billion, so it would be one of these uni- unicorns that uh, we call it nowadays. They've uh, updated their app. They're now, and it's interesting, they're color coding the, the calendars. You know, when they show you all the flight options, there are color codes that are pretty well done. It reminds me of Corner. I think it's an app we covered a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, look it up. It's always a great one to find deals. And I'll fi- finish with one called fairness not like fairness but i mean it's a clever use of word i guess <laughs> have you have you tried fairness alex i haven't tried it i I'm, i've been on the site and had a look at it i haven't actually used it so basically it the idea is a bit again a bit less it says uh where do you want to go so that's that's cool i mean uh, we know adioso does kind of that kind of stuff um you know kayak there are many websites kind of tell you okay open-ended kind of destination but this one is also is pretty cool because it'll tell you do you want to go to a beach do you want to go to Hawaii? Do you want to go with uh, a trip for nightlife? So you want to hang out and clubbing and et cetera. So it's pretty clever. Uh, I haven't tried it, uh, but it looks clever. And they also say that they'll find the lower, lowest price, obviously. Uh, they've been covered in publications like New York Times and Condi or Traveler. So I guess they're good. If you, again, if you want to try it, if you're in that kind of trip, so you really have like this open-ended and you just have a wish, I really want to go to a beach, you might try it. It doesn't really work well on, on a mobile phone, though. It, you'd better try it uh, on the on desktop. But uh, I mean, it's a pretty cool one. Uh, if anyone tries again, let us and know. Wants, yeah. uh, let us know if you like it. Uh, I use Atioso for that. You say I'm flying from London to anywhere, any date, these prices, and I get emails. That's pretty cool. And I hope these guys do a bit of a similar thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Kayak do that as well. They do a yes. good job with their email. Uh, yes. They, uh, the price alerts are extremely well done on Kayak. Yeah. Uh, Virgin America. <laughs> Virgin America continuing to innovate. They uh, just signed a big deal with Spotify and Netflix. To They've announced this, this uh, on the back of something that we covered uh, uh, several episodes ago, which says they're moving from ground-based Wi-Fi providers to satellite-based Wi-Fi providers, this, this company called Viasat. And kind of a, a celebration of that, they've announced this partnership with Spotify to give free streaming to anybody on the plane. And uh, this also includes Netflix as well. And there's they're painting one of the airplanes with, with Netflix on the side and all of that. But Viasat, one of the kind of nuggets that came out of this article is Viasat claim that they can deliver 12 megabits per second to this each seat. That's the capability that they're, they're that they're boasting. So, and that's why they're able to do the Netflix streaming, the audio streaming, the New York Times stuff. So, pretty cool. It doesn't. It's not going to happen until I think March of two thousand of next year, two thousand sixteen. So, but still, very very cool. Yeah, it's very cool. Uh, for those who have, who have Spotify, uh, for those who don't know, Spotify is a music streaming service. It's really cool. I've been using it since 2009 and I haven't used iTunes since then to tell you how much I like it. Uh, and I want to thank. Ben, ben Dressler, because he's the one who, who showed me that story about Spotify and, and Virgin America. You can actually, if you launch your Spotify app or on the desktop, uh, you can actually follow uh, Virgin America. They have now a profile, so like a username if you want. I'll put the link in the show notes. They already have a few playlists there. These are That's the same, quite cool. These are the same playlists, actually, that you can actually listen in the plane, so it's pretty cool. And they co- the code 
each playlist with a, a three-letter airport code. Very nice. Fun too, actually. Very yeah, nice. really fun. Talking about fun thing, you can also visit now uh, an A320 from Virgin America with a Google Street View. <laughs> so Google and Virgin America have had a relationship since before the airline even started flying because they uh, they were the first airline to have Google Maps as the as the the flight map provider um, so that that relationship has been going around since almost 10 years I would have thought so I'm glad to see that it's still going and they're doing cool stuff like this still talking about Wi-Fi because that's something that we all want I mean I'm not always a big fan to be honest but I know I'm totally an outlier Netflix because since you just mentioned it, Netflix also is really willing to dominate the air with with their with their offering it's true that we mentioned also that many times many airlines are now trying to ditch the ife uh for weights obviously and to say okay alex you bring your ipad your iphone your android whatever with you and we're going to stream you your content directly from your own device and netflix is really well positioned for that because you could say oh look at our our catalog is huge it's probably actually better than most of what ifes are currently offering yeah. maybe not emirates but I think they are on the right track to add. Absolutely, I agree. I think it's going to move in that direction. And I think airlines that don't provide IFE on short haul, BA, EasyJet, people like that, Ryanair, will quickly adopt things like that where you can stream to your device. I know Southwest does it and it works brilliantly. So Iceland Air, which I've never flown, I don't know if you've, if you've no, flown I haven't. yourself, they've released a very cool infographic. Obviously, it's to say that they have great Wi-Fi on air. And one of the things they, they have is they say for long-haul flights, uh, so they, they say that 95% of their flights have uh, Wi-Fi on board. They say Delta at 16%, Virgin Atlantic 10%, American Airlines 9%. British Airways, 0.3%. Uh, but it's a cool infographic because it, it also explains you how the Wi-Fi works. Uh, you know, there's either via satellite, via ground services, how the technology works. The one stat that says that 66% of the people were influenced by the fact whether there was Wi-Fi or not before booking uh, uh, a route. I don't know if you are yourself. Do you really look no. at Wi-Fi? No. <laughs> you're, is it a 767? Yes, I'm going to. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a nice perk, but, you know. Yeah, but a lot of people, according at least according to their stats, and I think CETA also creates uh, great reports about that. It's really something that people want more and more. And uh, so it's very, very well done infographic. I'll put the link. Uh, uh, one of the airlines actually uh, wants to ditch its uh, IFE. It's called WestJet. Have you ever flown them? No, I haven't, but they're a very good airline from what I understand. Um, the Canadian low-cost carrier. And apparently, yeah, so talking about that, so not only they want to ditch the uh, the IFE that they have on board and to, like I said earlier, have people stream from their own devices, but they're saying that they will do a low-cost low from London to North America for less than $100. Yeah, that's you, amazing. It, yeah, they, yeah. What, they got uh, 767s, right? Yeah, I think and they're so. going to fly them to Gatwick, which is great. Well, and Norwegian uh, Air CEO says that he's planning to do uh, these kind of flights, so transatlantic, for $69. I don't even know how that's possible because the, of the uh, the fees that you have flying out of the U.S., just like you do out of the U.K., but, you know, they've done a good job so far, Norwegian. They've got a fantastic network out of Gatwick, um, regional network out of Gatwick, and they also fly... Uh, internationally as well with brand new 787s as well. So I know they've had a lot of trouble getting DOT approval for the same reasons that any new startup airline does because they massive pressure from the incumbent airlines. But I I hope they do it. This would be amazing if they could even bring it down to 169 bucks or 269 bucks. I think our friend um, John Bradford is flying Norwegian soon. I'm not sure. I think he told me that, but maybe I'm, I'm mistaken. And another friend, I think Eric Nakagawa, who's uh, based in the, the West Coast, is also flying to Europe with Norwegians. So when they do, I hope to ask them how it is because it's, it, it must be interesting to see how the passenger experience is. One question I have for you, Alex. So if you, because, you know, when you fly low cost, you don't have much expectations, but do you think that having Wi-Fi on board, disregarding the rest, the rest of the product, makes for a, maybe an easier flight if you were to fly a low cost, long haul flight? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I I like having Wi-Fi on a on a flight. I think it's it's a good kind of if there's no if there's no IFE or anything like that, then yeah, it's a good distraction. You can crack on with work or just surf Reddit for nine hours. 
Um, <laughs> I have a feeling, and I hopefully he'll get in touch. I have a feeling that Greg Annandale, a uh, friend of the show, Greg Annandale, has flown on Norwegian. But we'll have to, Greg, tweet us. <laughs> yes, please do, because you're always good with your comments. Uh, so the passenger experience is obviously something that a lot of people you know, usually that's what you see on Twitter people complaining about. The CEO of, of, of Southwest, uh, I think you've flown them, I haven't, says, yeah, well, there's no problem with the passenger experience. And on the other side, United uh, with the interim CEO is refuting that there's a problem either. I think on one side, Southwest is actually pretty cool. Uh, I've, I've heard good stories. I mean, uh, the, the airline is profitable and it works well. And it's, again, it's not, it doesn't, over promise but it yeah. delivers on what it promises united's comments are a bit seems a bit more <clears throat> uh, wishful thinking yeah you know, yeah we... i think southwest i mean the gary kelly who's the ceo of, of southwest his remarks were in response to a an investor call and they the question was something like are oh, you know do you see any massive investments in the in the passenger experience or the physical product in the next few years and his response was basically uh, no because it works great uh, we don't need to improve it, and I think he's right. It's a, it's a to certain extent he's right. Yes, remarkably consistent, consistently good product. I mean, it's it's not luxury, it's not comfortable, but you, I love it. I think Southwest are great, even though they don't have any kind of loyalty program, they don't have any partnerships or anything like that. Um, they do a good job. I don't know why they would change it. Yeah, if you if you look at an airline like EasyJet, you would you could apply the same kind of of sentiments. You know, they they it's a great airline to fly with. It, it's, you get what you pay for, and I'll get to that in a minute. But it's actually more. I think it's actually a pretty good experience. And yeah. maybe they, I don't think they have Wi Fi yet, right? But you know, no, not yet. I don't. I think that they're toying with the idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure they would because you also also added revenue. Then they could say, oh, you have to pay for your entertainment, and people would yes. pay for maybe a few bucks for it. I don't Absolutely. know. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, the uh, IATA, which is one of the um, uh, global bodies covering the airline industry, the uh, outgoing CEO seems to be a little bit better when he says passengers uh, are getting what they pay for. Uh, so stop complaining. He didn't didn't say stop complaining, but it's. Is it not a bit of a, ref, a reflex from uh, an industry that is still used to the flag carrier concept? I think I'm, I think it depends what he's referring to. I think if you if you book a nine quid Ryanair fare and you're annoyed that there's no IFE, then you have or you have to pay for your food and your baggage. You made the wrong choice of airline. I think if you're talking about the difference between uh, you know a two hundred pound round trip and a twelve hundred pound round trip for the same seat. And all of the other, and all of the air passenger duty, and all of the other costs that we complain about weekly on this show, then I think that that's a very different story. And show, and you know, other things like getting off, do, doing a sort of, I don't know, Barcelona, London, Hong Kong, London, Barcelona, and getting off in London, and then the airlines coming after you. Theoretically, that type of nonsense has got to stop. But if you want flexibility, you pay for flexibility. If you want comfort, you pay for comfort. Um, uh, he says the airlines are delivering fantastic value for money and they're doing it in a way that is remarkably safe, secure, re reliable, and I agree. Different tiers for different people. Talking about delays, so we are lucky in Europe to have some regulations with the European Union about delays. We talked about it, of course, in a few episodes, including the last one. And Greg Annandale, that you just mentioned, came back to us with the story. Yeah, he did. This is really, really interesting. And thanks to Greg for, for getting back to us on it. Uh, he had taken a couple of flights that were extremely delayed, three three plus hours. And actually, one of them ended up being delayed for a full day. And he was wondering about how the, the, the best way to go and, and get back something for this huge delay, which which you know is, is not a small thing to to consider, you immediately kind of get put off by the idea of massive forms to fill out and bureaucracy. But he discovered this tool on moneysavingexpert.com, which is a UK-based financial advice, for want of a better expression, site. It's really, really good. And they have this, this tool to act, who, that will contact the airlines and submit a, a compensation request on your behalf. You All you, you do, and this is coming from Greg, is you select your airline and the reason for the delay fill out a shortly, partially pre-filled form detailing the delay and showing some kind of proof of travel, and that's it. They send it to the right place. They track the whole process for you. And 
basically he he likened it to open opening a compensation ticket with them and he's put some screenshots in and it really does look really really simple and then he got uh, a couple of days later an email saying yep uh we've reviewed your your file and we're going to give you not a small amount of money i mean this was hundreds i want to tell the exact amount but it was hundreds and hundreds of euros it was it was done very very quickly so what a great find yeah, and he he says that he had two experiences, one with KLM and the other one with SAS. Uh, so KLM, it went well. Uh, SAS, interesting, though, he mentioned that that the, the tool also pre-creates emails to escalate the issue. So you really, it's a one-click thing. So if you haven't got any news after, let's say, two weeks, three weeks, whatever, it's up to you, then you can just click one button and he kind of resends an email to say, hey, I'm still there, I'm still waiting for an, uh, an answer from you, or you can escalate it. So it's... It's very it's cool. clever. I've never tried any of these. The other one we mentioned was AirHelp, obviously. Uh, AirHelp just came out with, I, I don't know how they, uh, if they have a similar way of doing things. Uh, if anyone from AirHelp, anyone has tried it, let us know. Uh, but they've released a really uh, cool thing. It's called the uh, AirHelp score, where they score uh, how airlines are treating you of, for these kind of cases. So uh, the claim handling, the quality, of course, the quality performance, and the time they make to pay you out. And uh, the performers, they say the best ones are Air Baltic, number one, Austrian Airlines, number two, and Lufthansa, uh, number three. Uh, and I'm not going to name all of them, but the bottom three, uh, no, the bottom one is U.S. Airways, which obviously is not there anymore. Uh, uh, in the U.S., uh, United uh, is actually not the worst. You have Delta that is even worse in American. Again, the score is from zero to 800 uh, American, for instance, gets 350. They have an entire infographic on how they create that score. It's pretty cool. well done. That is also, cool. And they have also like a graph telling you where all these airlines, they do not cover all the airlines in the world, at least not yet, but they, they give you an idea where they stand. I can see, for instance, that like KLM looks uh, really brilliant uh, and EasyJet and Turkish Airlines don't. So maybe because they're late at paying or not late at responding, et cetera. So I'll, I'll direct you... Just follow the link on the show notes. It's pretty interesting to know how to ex- having some kind of expectation how the airline will treat you in case of these kind of delays, etc. So very cool, very cool. Uh, yeah, Expedia. Do you use Expedia at all to book your flights? Not really. No, I don't think I. Actually, you know what? I did. I did once, ah. and I regretted it immediately <laughs> because it was it was a try. It was a nightmare. It was last summer booking a flight from London to Atlanta. And it was cheaper than on Virgin Atlantic's website, which is unusual. But the restrictions and the ability to make changes was a nightmarish process, and I will never do it again. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I've never done it. Maybe I've done it once. But honestly, I cannot remember. I mean, it was not a hardness experience, but it was maybe not a great one either. It was like a very average or very good, actually. Uh, but they've done something interesting. I haven't tried it yet. They now reveal more amenities uh, of the flight you're about to take. So it's not limited to the Wi-Fi, but they're going to tell you uh, if when you book the, the flight, will you get some seat choices, what, what kind of amenities, et cetera. So it's pretty interesting. It's a, it's a beginning, I guess, because we've seen Google Google Flights doing also so revealing some stuff, whether there's Wi-Fi or not, et cetera. So I think it's a beginning of deep linking when you know the airline uh, system is actually offering more options back to the OTAs. There's a big debate, obviously, because OTAs, online uh, travel agents, want to be able to also uh, make a cut on stuff that the airline makes you pay for. So we know where it's going. But it's interesting to see that there's some sense of direction in offering a little bit more of information before you take a flight. It's good. I mean, that type of those types of small things, I mean, once you've figured out timings and price are actually pretty important. Uh, we mentioned in last episodes the Blue Smart carry on and the entire story about how the CEO was not handling it a, a, a good review. We thought very well. It seems to be like an amazing industry because every week there's a new one coming up, and this this week is something called a how do you pronounce it? Giro Giro uh, Giro Grow. I don't know. Uh, yeah, a- another week, another revolutionary carry on bag um that blows through its its kickstarter goal this one had a goal of 125,000 they're getting close to a million already with still with 47 days to go i have to say that this one 
while it's I th- I still think it's pretty dumb. At least they've focused on some very practical element. It still has the stupid things like a built-in tablet stand, uh, the battery, built-in battery, which I'll get back to in a second. But to their credit, and I would have bought this thing even if they didn't have all of the other nonsense attached to it, they've really focused on durability, ruggedness, longevity. So it's ballistic nylon, which whatever that means. Um, They use actual YKK zippers. The way that it's been designed for access, getting your your liquids out, and there's dedicated spot for your laptop and your and your tablet. It has a lifetime guarantee, which impresses me as well. It has these weird, big ass wheels. Yes, I've seen that. I don't. Look, the design looks nice. It looks very like futuristic or something. Yeah. I don't know if, uh, how it an- handles. One thing that I find interesting because I mean, first of all, you and I are not in the market for these type of carry on, so. You say it's nonsense, it's stupid. Maybe some people like it. We don't. We're going to come in a minute about some reservations we have about this. And one thing I like about them is that the entire uh, the battery and uh, tr- location tracker is a module. So it's optional. You can have the, the actual case without all the extra stuff that you consider nonsense. Yeah. So it, I, I think it's smart because it says, okay, it's a great luggage. We trust that even without the battery, it's still a great luggage. If you want to have your fancy stuff in, within it, you can have it as a model. Yeah. It's going to cost you a little bit more. And that's think, really that's smart. A nice, it's the right way to go. And one of all, com- of the, all of the ones that have come out, I like this one the most. I think yes, their me too. philosophy is good. The big wheels, I think they, they're they actually really smart because they, they roll a lot easier. They don't, they're not on uh, on casters, so they – they don't. They're not nearly as kind of flimsy or fragile for with torque. I, so, I'm gonna do. I'm. I'm a four wheel type of carrying. Me too. Person. Me too. <laughs> I like to have it. I don't know. It looks like it could actually be be handled horizontally and still. Uh, uh, sorry, vertically and still. But I mean, one thing I will say, and then I'll let you also go against the rail railing against uh, smart carry-ons is that. The one reality is that most people, if you travel in a single market like the US, probably it works because you have the TSA, they have pretty much the same regulation in every single airport. They will say, that's fine. This is how you're supposed to do it. If you're Alex and flying to Mumbai or even Frankfurt, you remember when I said a few episodes ago that in Frankfurt, they asked me to remove every single bit of electric items from my carry-on. They wanted even to x-ray the cables at one of the security point. How do I do that if if the the actual carry on is an electrical an electronic device, right? And yeah. second of it, uh, nowadays uh, in the US, but also now I've seen that at, at Heathrow. I don't know about the other airports. They ask you that you all your devices must be charged on before you take your flight because they want to test if they are actually devices or if they are fake. So do you have to remember to charge my my luggage every time I fly? That's the one I'm going to forget every time. So these are that kind of little kind of things that. I don't know how realistic you can use such a luggage if you were to if you were to fly like someone like me or Alex uh, around the world because some of the security will look at you and say are you insane this yeah. is not going in no absolutely uh, absolutely I think the way that they've designed it just from a piece of luggage is great it looks really solid the things that they focused on like the materials the zips telescoping handle those are the things that always break first but you know. All of the points that you made are are absolutely spot on. And another thing is, let's say for some reason you're on a you know a, a Dash Eight or an ATR. Um, I know that you're a huge fan of both of those airplanes. <laughs> um, and they go, no, 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 you need to gate check that. Then becomes a real risk because the lithium ion batteries are the ones that airlines are super worried about having in the cargo holds because when they catch fire, which they have a propensity to do, it can be absolutely devastating. So unless it's really, really easy to remove the charging component from the bag and you remember to do it at the gate when they say, no, you can't bring it on board, I think that there's a there's a safety risk in, in all, not just this one. But in anything that's got a built-in battery. We'll talk about security at, at, at Mumbai a little bit later. And you, you'll realize that it's not always easy as well to just pass through it. But I agree <laughs> with your point. And again, I wish them well. I love this carry-on. I love this suitcase. I would consider it mm. if I were in the market for one. Uh, I prefer my Travel Pro. They're very sturdy and basic. And they have little things that I, I haven't looked at this one in particular. But like having a handle on each side of the carry-on is 
something that is so simple but so clever because it means yeah. you can try to fit your car on any way you want in the overhead bin and then still take it. You don't have to fiddle it around. I think these are the small things. These guys will learn and other, other guys will learn. So I wish them well. Uh, I hope people will buy it. And if either the founders or if anyone using one when it's being delivered wants to come on the show and tell us how great it is or any other carry on, by the way, we're, we're happy to be convinced. Yeah. Please let us know. Please give us a shout out. Another thing we mentioned a few episodes ago that uh, we're not sure about whether GoPros, you know, you know what you know, GoPro is, is these very small cameras that everybody uses now to do from kite surfing to whatever, jumping off a cliff or something. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen some pilots having that within the flight deck. Yes. And, and we were not sure if whether they were, you know, it's an added piece of equipment. So is it legal or not, because in case of crash, these kind of things can fly, et cetera, et cetera. Apparently, uh, because of the cost of these things are going down and down, there's more and more pressure to actually, uh, to allow them actually to mandate flights, especially small jets, to have them to monitor. It's like in a car, like having dashboard cam to monitor what really happened in the flight deck before an incident or an accident. Yeah. Do, do you think it's coming? I'm sure it is. And with the, with the compression technology that we have today, I don't think we're too far away from seeing that that information beamed down to somebody, be it the airline uh, operations team or some someone else to, to keep an eye on as well. And you found a crazy video, I think it was on Jalopnik. That video is pretty cool. I mean, let's just, Amazing. It's, a few, it's a few seconds, right? Yeah, it's 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 a it's an Instagram video. So I think it, it can only be 15 seconds long or 10 seconds long or whatever, but it's this uh, extraordinary landing of a of an Embraer. I don't even know where it was, but it was caught in a crosswind, and the pilot is like wrestling with the flight with the yoke, getting this plane beautifully on the ground. But I think, uh, and then you did some digging and found a lot more about the the plane and the pilot, which is just super interesting. Yeah, because uh, the video was here there, but it was an embed from Facebook. And it was, you know, Facebook nowadays, you have all these videos, people just rip them off. You don't know what the origin, but there was a little name on the video called LF737, I think. And I went online and I found an Instagram account. She's a pilot from Pegasus. Pegasus is an airline in Turkey. And her Instagram account is really cool because she she shares a lot of videos of other aircrafts as well, with diverse angles, some of them pictures. It shows you like this kind of behind the scene life of, of an airline pilot that is really, really cool. So I put the link because you should definitely, definitely check it out. And she says on that video in particular that you guys have to see, uh, she says it's still easier than ironing. <laughs> I yeah, I think her, her, her Instagram account is amazing. It's, it's, She's clearly like not just a pilot, but an aviation junkie as well. And these, a lot of these videos and, and pictures seem to be from delivery flights. So she's she's taking delivery of a new airplane yeah, and bringing it home. Airplanes, but, yeah. uh, super super cool. Talking about uh, social media, you were online the other day, and suddenly you you send me something. You said, "Oh, the Concorde, the one that sits at Heathrow, it just disappeared." And this created these old conspiracy theories. <laughs> Don't trust everything you read online. So yeah, it, it is not there anymore, right? No, it's not there anymore. So, but it doesn't disappear. It's not being scrapped. Where yeah. is it? It was really funny because, of course, this popped up on airliners and everyone was freaking out going, they're going to restore it. It's going to fly again. And, of course, <laughs> no, it's the um, it's the uh, approaching the anniversary of uh, of the last flight into Heathrow. So it's okay. been taken into one of the maintenance hangars to give a uh, uh, to be given a bit of a spit polish, uh, which it so rightly deserves because it does sit out there in the elements uh, all year. Um, so they've taken it into into one of the hangars to to clean up, which is which is fantastic. So it it will be back. I don't believe. I mean, of course, you might have not even seen that tempest in a teapot because it only happens with people like us who are browsing Reddit and other flyer talks and airliners about this kind of stuff. But very quickly, there was a picture on. I think it was even an official picture from BA, and you showed the Concorde just in the hangar being cleaned. So that's nothing more than that. But yeah. shows that sometimes the news cycle is a bit a- crazy. But it was really funny because we were both like, "What? Where is it? What was going to yeah, happen? Yeah, what's happening? Like- <laughs> is it going to come screaming over Paul's house and even it?" <laughs> well, uh, so you didn't fly the Concorde to Mumbai. Uh, it would have been cool because you could have been there like in maybe like, what, five hours? Instead yeah, that'd of, be uh, good. But uh, maybe one day. Uh, we told said last week that it will reappear. So tell us a little bit about uh, the airport. We've both been there. 
The difference is, that's interesting for once, because we have different experiences. You've been in the international uh, uh, terminal, the brand new international terminal. Yeah. I think it's, it looks really nice with the pictures. I've only been in a domestic because I was flying with uh, in, uh, within India to go to Kochi, I think it was back, back then. So I have a different experience than yours, but I want to listen to you about this big, massive new terminal and how the experience was. Yeah, it was good. It's it's a brand new terminal, only opened up last year, Terminal 2. And it's architecturally, it's stunning. It's, uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like these big p- pillars that that kind of cone upwards to support the roof. And it all looks like um, you're inside of a massive beehive. You should, you should Google it and check out some of the pictures because it's really extraordinary. Um, when we went in and out, it was empty. And a friend of ours on the ground in Mumbai said that's because uh, a lot of the flights come and go in the evening and early morning. Uh, we were coming and going at very quiet times, so the airport felt deserted. But, and this is a, this is something you should know if you're ever going out of Mumbai, you have to have your either your boarding pass or your ticket printed out to get even inside the terminal. They won't even let you in. There's somebody, some like military maybe even. That checks. They will do pre-check. Yes, pre-check. It happens then- to a lot of emerging countries. Uh, I remember having similar experiences in the Philippines, for instance, and they would not let you within the, the airport at all if you don't pre-check first. It's not you're not going through immigration security, guys. If you've never done that, you just have to get into the building, into the airport. Yeah, it's crazy, and and the amount of times that somebody wanted to look at our boarding pass and then stamp. I think it was eight. Our passes were stamped eight times from, mm-hmm. from walking into the terminal to getting on the airplane. That, a, it security, was, security is something quite, how was, I know Greg had a lot of uh, video equipment. Was it easy for him to, to, to go there to do the security? And the it took a stuff? while, but only because the security guy was a photographer himself. <laughs> and so they were just <laughs> geeking out over the, over the stuff. But, um, yeah, I don't. They asked questions, but no more kind of invasive than than I would have expected. No, I I, I find I find the same. I, I'm asking that because it's 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 known to be a tighter. It doesn't mean that it's worse. Uh, actually, I think camera equipment was forbidden within aircrafts in India until 2005 or something. So it's really yeah. something very recent. They've been. I've, I remember having to go through, I mean, security was not worse than anyone else, certainly not worse than sometimes the TSA in the US. <laughs> no. But it's true that you better be informed of what you can bring in. There might be some differences between what you can usually bring in, whether it's Europe, US, or uh, maybe even Japan, and there. So just be careful because they will actually, uh, for instance, if you have a lighter, they will not let you have a lighter, any kind of lighter in, in the aircraft at all. They will remove them. Little things like that is not a big deal. But you have to know that if you fly in any airport like in India. But tell us about Mumbai. Sorry. Well, no, I mean, that, that, you're absolutely right. I think that's that's another thing. I, when I went to to check in, we were we were both hanging luggage only, both already checked in. But we could we had to collect our boarding passes. You could, We couldn't do mobile boarding. And even if you're – you've – printed out your boarding pass somewhere, you still have to go to the check-in desk. Correct. Uh, which is an, an uh, which was another kind of, almost anachronism really. But then there's outbound immigration, then security, then I think there's a customs, then they want to talk to you to get into the gate area, then they want to talk to you to get onto the airplane. That's fine. But the, the facility itself is light, airy, obviously very modern, it's only a year old, phenomenally fast Wi-Fi, good food, uh, nice. great seats, and it was cool because, like I said, it was quiet. But one of the planes that I – two of the interesting planes I did see was an Iraqi Airways <laughs> flight to Baghdad, which was really neat to see. They're ba- think- they banned over the skies in Europe so uh, yeah. because of some which security th- issues. Not because, you know, not of any danger, political danger, but just because apparently they're not safe enough to fly. That's what Yeah, I, I think they're getting there. These are, This was a brand new airplane. And then um, – there was a Vistara, which is the joint venture between Singapore Airlines and the Tata Group mm-hmm. in India, which and beautiful livery and all of that stuff. That, that makes um, me that makes me think because I know sometimes some plane spotters are listening to us. Uh, I just mentioned that cameras were a, a big problematic within aircrafts. Know that uh, if you take a picture from the airport itself, and that applies to all India, it's okay. But if you try to take a picture uh, outside of the airport, you know, like a traditional plane spotter would do. 
uh, chances are that the police will come and inter interrogate you. They still are very itchy about this. So just do not go and think you can take a lot of pictures of planes. They will come. There's a few places. I'll put the link on the show notes around the airport in Mumbai where you can take pretty cool pictures of planes. But the police is always, you know, going around and asking you and maybe asking you to leave. This is, they're still a bit itchy about that. So be, again, you know, you're in a foreign country, be uh, smart about it and just don't do stupid things. So just be careful. Yeah, it, that's absolutely right. And I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a cool airport. I, I was impressed. Was it, was it easy to get to the city? Yeah. Uh. No. Um, well, we were in, we were in Naraman Point, which is that's where we were staying, is a very southern point of of Mumbai. Um, but the easiest way to get there is with a prepaid taxi. So when you arrive and you've gone through customs and you're out, if you go downstairs, there's the prepaid taxi desk. You just tell them where you're going. They'll tell you the price, which is kind of quasi negotiable, and it's very very reasonable. And they give you a coupon with a specific taxi registration number written on it. You go outside, you find that exact taxi, get in and they take you. You don't have to pay anything to the to the taxi. But that's the, the Mumbai traffic is 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 something else. Yeah, it is absolutely. My experience was obviously a bit different. The terminal is older, obviously. It's not as fancy, but that's expected anyway because usually domestic uh, terminals are never as fancy in international gates that are big new terminals are. But there's really, when I say there's not, not a lot to do, uh, we always ask ourselves a question, is it a good uh, airport for layover? I would say the domestic one is not because there's not a lot to do. There's actually not, a, you know, the, 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 the rationale is you, you land, you go to the next gate and you fly out. So there's not a lot of entertainment, cafes, etc. There's Wi-Fi. I remember even like when I was, it was almost two years, a year and a half ago, Wi-Fi was, was, was solid. Uh, there was a little bit of refurbishments. It was not always very clear where to go, but I mean, it was, a, okay airport, nothing amazing, but nothing either dire, but just it's not a good airport to say layovers. And be very careful if you have to transit from one terminal to the other, meaning the international one to the domestic on, on, or the opposite way, it's actually not that easy. It, these are not just like They're next four door. kilometers it's, apart. Exactly. Four, which, and then you have to integrate what Alex just told you about the traffic. So if you plan a, a trip, maybe using one of the tools we mentioned today, another, and you say, oh, I'm just going to, you know, switch terminal is going to be easy. Allow yourself a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> Not only traffic plus security plus all the boarding pass checks that you'll have to go through. But you know what? It's really worth going. It That's absolutely is. It's, it's absolutely a hell of a city. Is. But I'm jealous. I'm jealous you've been to the new terminal. I'll have to, 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 to check that one soon enough. Hey, just keep looking out for those fares, man. 208 pounds or whatever it was. Yeah. Uh, by the way, if anyone knows, I mean, we'll reach out to them. But if you want to know people behind secret flying uh, and or if you are part of the team, just reach out to us. We really would like to interview you to have us guest at our show. We, if, if you don't want to be known, we can even anonymize your voice, et cetera. But I really, we really want to know how crazy you must be in that same a positive way to find all these deals, how you, you know, gather all of them in a single space because it's really well done. It's one of our get-to-go sites and it's really, really well done. Amazing. Yeah, so good. On that, Alex, uh, we're back in London, dreams of India. We both hope we're going to get back soon. But for those who have never been or are interested, watch out next week for the new Attaché episode of Alex. I'm, I'll be one of the first to watch it. I'm sure Alex will send me a private link whenever yes, it's up. Yes, of course. <laughs> and on that, I'll see you next week, maybe. We keep saying that. So next episode. Next episode. That's probably more accurate with all the traveling that's going on. <laughs> okay, Alex, happy travels. Take care, guys. On behalf of Layovers and the entire crew, we would like to thank you for joining us on this podcast today. And we're looking forward to seeing you on board again next week. Flight attendants, please prepare for landing. <laughs>